So, hi everyone, my name is Leonardo Leite. I'm a PhD student at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And this research is a joint effort of me and prof professors of three different universities in Brazil. So, my co-authors are... Hello, my name is Gustavo. I'm a professor here at the Federal University of Pará. Hi, I'm Professor Fabio Com from the University of Sao Paulo. Hello, I'm Paulo Miremes from Federal University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And Professors Com and Mireles are my PhD advisors. So the start point for my PhD research was the topic of DevOps. So we performed a literature review uh, about DevOps that was published in the ACM Computing Service Journal. Uh, in this work, we, we received the collaboration also from a professor of another university of Brazil and from our research of HP Labs in California. In this survey, we found almost 200 papers about DevOps, academic papers, uh, excluding works published in workshops. From these found papers, we fully examined uh, 50 papers, and based on this analysis, we presented DevOps concepts and challenges. But the challenge that matters for this presentation is this one, how to deploy DevOps in an organization, but not deploy or adopt in DevOps in the sense of tooling, but rather in the sense of human interactions. So it's about pattern of interactions among developers and the infrastructure specialists. So we found there, there was a gap in the literature about this topic, but there, are, there were some works about it. In this work, we found some patterns that we call organizational structures about these, these interactions. So the first one is when you have developers and infrastructure people in different groups, but they collaborate among them. So, uh, Professor Gustavo Pinto and his colleagues, they published a paper about this. And in this paper, uh, it was about a case study that uh, it was a case study of an organization that was following this pattern. And in this work, they found that a culture of collaboration is the core concern of DevOps. The second pattern is the cross-functional team. It's advocated by Amazon. So it's the idea that if you develop a service, you must operate it. And the third pattern is the idea that you have a DevOps team acting as a bridge between developers and operators. Professors Mereles and Kohn, they published a paper, it's also a case study about a project that followed this pattern, for example. And by the way, Mrs. Wayne, that's here as author, uh, she also published a paper in DZX, that's in the near track. But uh, this talk, it's about another pattern of interaction that was not foreseen for that works that we studied in the survey. This pattern we call platform teams. Platform teams are infrastructure teams that provide highly automated infrastructure services to empower developers for application deployment. Actually, not only application deployment, but also all the runtime management which can include, for example, monitoring. So back into our problem, we found that uh, the literature about it is very scarce. Most of their sources are non-academic, and even the academic sources, they are more listing the structures, but not really trying to discover them in the field. So we want to go in the field with a scientific approach to discover which organizational structures are software producing organizations adopting for managing IT technical teams in a continuous delivery context. But not only finding these structures, but also have an idea about how well continuous delivery is working in these structures. So we decide to check the delivery performance of the organizations too. Delivery performance is a construct uh, proposed by the book Accelerate. It combines uh, three metrics, frequency of deployment, time from commit to production and mean time to recover. Together, these three metrics, they say how well continuous delivery is working in the organization. Each metric, uh, it has a liquid scale. So for example, this is the scale for the metric 
importance of deployment. So according to the book, an organization is a high performer if it can deploy multiple times per day, if the commit takes less than one hour to reach production, and uh, the organization takes less than one hour to recover from incidents. Uh, in our work, an organization is a high deliverer if it's in this pattern, or if you violate one of these patterns by one point in the scale. It was necessary to do something like this, because in the book, in the original work, there was, there was a gap between the high performance and the medium performance. So if the organization is in this gap, we couldn't classify, so we need some approach like this. So for our work, we interviewed 27 people, seven in initial phase called brainstorm sessions, and 20 in some structured interviews. The brainstorm sessions, they started on January of last year. There we got feedback on our res research question and we discussed concerns raised by our DevOps survey. We also shaped the question for the following semi-structured interviews. But more important than here, it was already in this phase that it started to emerge the concept of platform teams. The semi-structured interviews, they started in April last year and there we interviewed people of different roles, different countries, different genders, and levels of experience. And these people, they were working in organizations of different types, different, different sizes, and different domains. Uh, the main questions we discussed in the interviews, they were about responsibilities. For example, who is responsible for deployment, for building new environments, for non-functional requirements, for monitoring, for incident handling, especially after hours. We also asked about future improvements that uh, participants expect to see in the organization. So it was also an indirect way to ask about what was not so good in the organization at that moment. There were also other questions, but more importantly, we asked the questions to check the delivery performance of the organization. So we could classify each organization as a high performer or a non-high performer. <coughs> so for analyzing interviews, we employed gradient theory a rigorous and systematic methodology used for research in software engineering. We also followed the guidelines prescribed by Roth for building taxonomies. So in this way, we got our taxonomy with four organizational structures that are silo departments, classical DevOps, cross-functional teams, and platform teams. By the way, the presentation of this taxonomy is the, is the subject of our poster presentation, the X poster track of this year. And this is our poster. Uh, so let's talk briefly about each structure. First, in the siloed organizations, there are limited uh, collaboration among departments and barriers for continuous deployment. In classical DevOps, uh, there is an intense collaboration among the areas. Uh, and developers and operators are in, in different departments, but there is an intense collaboration. And in cross-functional teams, uh, the cross-functional team is responsible for both developing the application and managing the infrastructure. The three structures uh, presented, they were somehow expected, but the big surprise, let's put it in this way, it was precisely the platform teams, which we will describe in details. But we found also organizations transitioning from one structure to another. Therefore, it's important to highlight that in a single organization, structures can evolve over time. And also, if you take different slices of the organization, these different slices can behave according to different patterns. Therefore, the classification we did is not precisely for the whole organization, but actually for the interviewee's context. So let's talk now about the seven practical implications we found for platform teams. <clears throat> practical implication one, 
product teams are fully accountable for the non-functional requirements of its services. It means that developers now operate their own services, and a consequence of it is that developers are the first ones to handle incidents. It's different from classical DevOps. In classical DevOps, the operations group, they are still responsible for things like uptime. Therefore, if there is any problem in production, infrastructure people will take a look, try to solve, maybe rolling back, and if they find their the problem is somehow code related, they call developers. In platform teams is different. Developers or the product team, they are responsible for business services. And the platform team is responsible for infrastructure services. Therefore, if there is any problem in, infrastructure, in business services, developers have to take a look and try to solve. If, there is, if they check that the problem is because of some infrastructure service, so do you call platform team to ask help. Practical implication two. Developers are not afraid of non-functional requirements concerns. And this happens because uh, the platform it handles a lot of these non-functional concerns. The platform can cope, for example, with load balance, outscaling, throttling, and monitoring and others. And developers are also not afraid to take this responsibility because there, are, there is support and collaboration from the platform team. So if it's necessary, the platform team will help. So you have in the right side here, inside of the department, it's very hard to achieve collaboration on areas. And in the other side, uh, we have really collaboration among the groups of developers and the groups of infrastructure people. Uh, but in certain way, in classical DevOps, you somehow expect that uh, these groups will collaborate all the time. They will talk all the time, have meetings together all the time, but it's different in platform teams. The third product implication is that the product teams, developers, should be decoupled for, from the platform team. Uh, therefore, they don't have to talk all the time. They communicate only in certain situations that are for solving incidents, uh, this is investigating problems, when platform team provides consulting, uh, especially for non-functional requirements, or when devs as customers of the platform, that's a product, they demand new features, new capabilities from the platform. Project complication four, the infrastructure team is no more requested for operational tasks. So the idea is that if developers have to build a new environment, they need a new environment, they will not open a ticket that some infrastructure person will take to create the environment. Developers will use self-service self -service services provided by the platform to create such a new environment. Project complication five. Uh, usually in the product teams, uh, you will not find infrastructure specialists. And this is because the platform makes it easier to manage the infrastructure. So you have here a difference from the platform team's context and cross-functional teams. In cross-functional teams, the team manages the infrastructure to operate the services. In a certain way, the same happens for developers in the platform context. But for this, they use the platform, so it's much easier. Therefore, we don't expect to find infrastructure experts inside the development team in a platform context. It's not the case for cross-functional teams. A cross-functional team should have an infrastructure expert, uh, an infra infrastructure expert, even it's not even it's not always the case. Uh, practical implication six. However. Uh, sometimes it's necessary to have some kind of operators within the product team. We saw one situation like this. The idea is that the platform is tailored for the typical use case uh, of the organization. So if some application has special needs, maybe it will require such operators. But in the case we saw, the manager, it was already planning to reduce the number of such operators in a near future, the operators within the product team. And product implication seven, 
is that now infrastructure spe specialists possess coding skills. After all, they are building uh, the platform that's a product. So we expect they to have some skills like Terraform, Chef, Puppet, and so on. But actually, it depends on the type of the platform that you discuss now. The first type of platform is the in-house open source platform. So for example, you can have Rancher, that's open source, and it's a graphical facade for Kubernetes, that's also open source. So you take all of these and install in your data center. In this situation, uh, it, uh, the platform team uh, will not need to code, or it, if to code, it will be just a, a little. But the organization can swap Rancher for a custom platform that's built in-house. In this case, the platform team will need to code a lot. And the third type of platform is the cloud facade. In this situation, the platform acts as a facade for services provided by cloud vendors. In this situation, you could ask, why the platform? Why don't developers just use the cloud services? Are they not easy to use? Well, it's not so easy because there are hundreds of services in each cloud provider. And so developers will have to study a lot, become specialists, and then all the time decide which services to use. And maybe there will be hard questions um, because cost if different developers use different cloud providers. So the idea is that a core group in the organization, that's the platform team, will provide a layer of standardization. Uh, the idea is not necessarily to enforce uh, some standard. If developers have some special need, maybe they can bypass the abstraction and use directly cloud service. But this layer it can provide some benefits like some internal billing. So in one example we saw, uh, developers even they didn't know there was Google Clouds behind the scenes. Or if, if they know, uh, it was because someone told them, but the use of platform, it was very transparent. Uh, and this is our data for deliver performance. But the bottom line here is that from all the organizations we saw fully embracing platform teams, all of them were high performers. Okay, three is not a so high number, but on the other hand, no other structure provided such property. And moreover, uh, the single silo the organization we saw that was a high performer, it was already also adopting platform teams. So based on these uh, statements, we claim in our emerging theory that having a platform team is a promising way to achieve high delivery performance. Uh, let's talk a little bit about related work. So there are some academic works that they try to investigate the patterns of interaction among developers and operators, but uh, the ones we found, no one of them discussed platform teams. A uh, good example of a work that's very similar to us is from Shaheen and colleagues. And the other type of works uh, is the works that talk something about platform teams but they are industrial works. They don't follow scientific guidelines. Good examples of them are the DevOps Topologies site and the Team Topologies book. So we are in the intersection. Therefore, our contribution is to empirically detecting platform teams in the field with a scientific approach and empirically associate them to high delivery performance. So it's useful here to remember our timeline. So first, we were reading about DevOps, then we could choose a problem, a research question, and we decided to apply ground theory. Since ground theory recommends restrict the exposure to the literature, we stopped to look for more works. So, so in the initial phase, we read about DevOps and, and found our, our problem, and after finding our problem, problem, we stopped to reading more about it. 
So the platform teams concept emerged from our data, from the interviews. After we have our taxonomy, we followed reading more related works, where we could find that industrial works about platform teams and even the work of Shaheen. So this is past and present, uh, but the future is our ongoing work. So we are conducting more interviews since 27 is actually not a high number. So right now we already have 46 interviews. Uh, so we now can claim that we have reached enough of theoretical saturation. That's a notion of ground theory. It's the idea that uh, if you take uh, much more interviews, it will not contribute so much for your theory that's emerging. We also get feedback. It's the idea of checking the resonance with participants. So we sent uh, web forms for getting the opinion of people that were already interviewed. And uh, we also performed some interviews specifically to getting feedback. So with this improvement that and improvements in the taxonomy itself, we are very near to a next submission. So we hope that uh, soon we will have a journal paper about this work of us. And after this publication, in the next phase, that is the last phase of my PhD, I hope, is about to discuss more of how to choose a structure. Uh, how a, an organization would decide for one structure and not another. So you will try to understand better the context and the forces that lead an organization to a certain path. And for this, we apply the methodology of case study. So that's all. Thanks so much for watching. If you have any question, please don't hesitate to contact us. It will be a pleasure. So see you. Bye.